Hello and welcome to The Authority Gap. I'm Marianne Seacart. When Mary McAleese was President of Ireland, she led an official visit to the Vatican to meet Pope John Paul II. She was in the audience room at the head of her delegation, about to be introduced to him, when he reached straight past her, held out his hand to her husband instead, and asked him, would you not prefer to be President of Ireland rather than married to the President of Ireland? Her husband knew better than to take the Pope's hand. As she told me in an interview for The Authority Gap, I reached and took the hand which was hovering in midair and said, let me introduce myself. I am the President of Ireland, Mary McAleese, elected by the people of Ireland, whether you like it or whether you don't. However much we say we believe in equality these days, we're still in practice more reluctant to accord authority to women than to men, even when they're leaders or experts. Every woman has a tale to tell about being underestimated, talked over, ignored, patronised, interrupted, and generally not taken as seriously as a man. And when I say woman, of course, I mean anyone who presents as a woman. Great strides have been made, and many men are good and respectful listeners. But however liberal we think we are, we're nowhere near there. There's still what I call an authority gap between women and men. And the authority gap is the mother of all gender gaps. Because if women aren't taken as seriously as men, they're going to be paid less, promoted less, and held back in their careers. They're going to feel less confident and less entitled to success. If we don't do anything about it, the gap between women and men will never disappear. Now, when I put together some slides to give another lecture on this, I knew I had to start by defining my terms. So I took a screenshot of the Oxford Dictionary Online's definition of authority, first to come up on my Google search. And guess what? Every sentence it offered as examples began with the same pronoun. There was, he has the natural authority of one who is used to being obeyed. He hit the ball with authority and he was an authority on the stock market. I couldn't have found a neater illustration of the way we instinctively associate men more than women with authority. But didn't Margaret Thatcher have the natural authority of one who was used to being obeyed? Doesn't Serena Williams hit a ball with authority? Isn't Helen Morrissey an authority on the stock market? The same happened when I searched in Google Images for something to illustrate a slide on expertise. In the first 20 pictures, there wasn't a single woman. Bart Simpson appeared before we reached the first female in a group with men. And finally, there was a decent sized photo of a woman, but Oh, it turned out she was ha having something explained to her by a male expert. I'll give you another example of the authority gap from one of the many fascinating women I interviewed for the book. Louise Richardson is the first woman to run the University of Oxford, which is by some measures the best university in the world. But she still finds her authority is challenged. She told me a great story. She said, I presided at congregation and I sit on a throne chairing a meeting with 350 people. And there were a couple of people there who had a role in it. It was their first time, and I've done it a dozen times. When I was in mid-speech in front of 350 people, this guy said, you've got it wrong, you should be reading this, pointing to another part of my script in front of everybody. I said, thank you, but actually I've got it right. And I proceeded. I said to him the next day, I'd just like you to give a little thought to one question. Would you have done that yesterday if I were a male vice chancellor? Would you have interrupted a male VC speaking publicly to a room full of people in a very formal setting to correct what they were saying, especially when this was your first time at the gathering? And as it turned out, you were wrong. I said, I did that mental experiment myself last night. I'd just like to ask you to do that mental experiment. So this is the mental experiment I'd like us all to do every day. We might not notice that we're taking women less seriously than men. We might not notice that we interrupt them more, challenge their expertise more and listen to them less, but many of us do. It makes women fume, it dents their confidence and it holds them back. So it's high time we changed our behavior. And it's not just men who do it. For however progressive and intelligent or indeed female we think we are, scientific studies show that we all, women as well as men, have unconscious biases even against our own gender. We may not be aware of them, they're called unconscious for a reason, but they do spill out into our behavior. And unless we notice and correct for them, 
we'll continue to assume that a man knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise, while for a woman, it's all too often the other way around. The authority gap will remain as wide as ever. To see this more clearly, it helps to flip things round. So if you're a man, try this. Imagine living in a world in which you're routinely patronized by women. Imagine having your views ignored or your expertise frequently challenged by them. Imagine trying to speak up in a meeting only to be talked over by female colleagues. Imagine women subordinates resisting you as a boss merely because of your gender. And imagine women superiors promoting other women, even if they're less talented than you. Imagine people almost always addressing the woman you're with before you. Imagine writing a book and finding that half the population is reluctant to read it because it's written by a man. Imagine being trolled by women on social media threatening violence against you merely for expressing an opinion. Not great, is it? See, the trouble is that privilege is often invisible. Most men simply don't notice it until it's flipped round like this. And why would they? I struggle to notice my white privilege. Yet in everyday life, it's as if men are swimming with the current in a river and women are swimming against it. So the men see the banks racing past them and congratulate themselves for swimming so powerfully. And they look at the women struggling to make headway against the current and think, why can't they swim as fast as me? They're obviously not as good. So this means there is a deep asymmetry. When I talk to men about this subject, a lot of them express skepticism. They tell me the problem's been solved, that my thesis is out of date. If anything, women are being privileged and they're suffering. And this is because they can't see the continuing bias and we can. They don't experience the myriad little insults to their self-esteem and competence that women have to put up with daily or weekly. So not only is their reaction as wrong-headed as a white person telling a person of color that racism doesn't exist, it also proves the exact point of this book, that women's authority is questioned and challenged even when they know more than the person they're talking to. Because as you'll see, there's a huge amount of evidence for the continued existence of the authority gap and it's resistant to being mansplained away. Now, if a woman thinks that she's being taken less seriously than man, it's hard for her to prove that she's the victim of discrimination. He just might be better than her. And women are often accused of citing sexism to disguise their inadequacy. But there's one very persuasive way of testing this hypothesis that women are unjustifiably respected less and thought to be less competent and expert than men. Talk to people who've lived as both. Because they're exactly the same person, with the same intelligence, ability, experience, and personality, and the only thing that's changed is their gender, they are uniquely able to identify the effect of gender in their lives. It's a way of correcting for all the other variables and isolating the one that matters. Now, I'm gonna tell you the story of two science professors at Stanford who happened to transition in opposite directions at the same time. Ben Barris, a neuroscientist, was astonished by the difference it made to his life when he started living as a man. I've had the thought a million times, he wrote, I am taken more seriously. At one seminar, a faculty member who didn't know his history was heard to say, oh, Ben Barris gave a great seminar today, but then his work's much better than his sister's. <laughs> they were, of course, the same person. Barris concluded, by far the main difference that I've noticed is that people who don't know I'm transgendered treat me with much more respect. I can even complete a whole sentence without being interrupted by a man. Meanwhile, Joan Roughgarden, an evolutionary biologist, found exactly the opposite when she started living as a woman. She said, you get interrupted, you need to find a male to support what you said, and not get offended if a male says the same thing and claims credit for it, because at least you got the message out. This is what you have to navigate. At first, I was amused, she said, after describing how she was much more frequently interrupted, ignored and condescended to by men, particularly those who hadn't known her before. I thought, if women are discriminated against, then I'm darn well going to be discriminated against the same way. Well, the thrill of that's worn off, I can tell you. Her conclusion, men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, whereas a woman is assumed to be incompetent until she proves otherwise. 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.